Hello, my name is Corey Peterson, and I will be discussing Chapter 8, entitled Planning Theory and the City, by Susan Feinstein. In this article, she argues that there is a theoretical weakness within planning theory and explores the historical roots and the context of planning theory and discusses what should be done. Ms. Feinstein begins by explaining that courses in within city and regional planning typically are split into three categories. The first is the object of planning, such as redevelopment policies or environmental policies. The context, which is structure of cities and regions or urban history. And third, we have the process of planning such as planning theory and planning methods. She explains that generally there is a division with the object and context courses having little reference to the theories of the planning process. She goes on to state that because there is a division within those courses, ultimately there is also a division within the planning theory courses divided up between the socio-spatial constraints under which they do it or the object that they seek to affect, both having little reference to each other. In her article, she argues that there is such a narrow definition of planning theory that it results in a theoretical weakness arising from the isolation of process from context and outcome. And she also states that the object of planning theory should be to formulate answers to the following two questions. Under what conditions can conscious human activity produce a better city for all citizens? And how do we explain and evaluate the typical outcomes of planning as that has existed so far. Before exploring her argument any further, Feinstein lists three caveats that apply. One, her argument does not apply to all courses in theory or to all theorists. Two, her argument reflects her own personal value orientation and the purpose of planning is to create the just city. 3. The term the city refers to any spatial unit as an object of planning, such as a city or a region. Feinstein first looks at the historical roots and justification of planning theory. Planning in the early 20th century was devoted to producing a desired object, such as Howard's Garden City Model or Burnham City Beautiful. This allowed them to focus on the outcome rather than the process. This theory assumed to be in the general interest of society as well as guided by experts. With growing bias and corruption within the government, planners sought for independent planning commissions that would be headed by disinterested appointed officials. This would remove politics from policies and allow experts to develop policies away from selfish interests. The outcome of this was th that the process was now independent of the outcome where public would de delegate their goals to appointed representatives. Planners would then get together to determine the proper process to achieve these goals. Unfortunately this caused problems as there was too many different perspectives on the proper way to achieve them. Often the goals of planners become misaligned with those of elected officials establishing public policy. Uh, this can happen for political issues as well as economic issues. Take for example in Hearst with the expansion of the Northeast Mall um, 15 years ago when a whole neighborhood was displaced in order to expand more stores. Uh, this could be shown as economic pressure 
in order to bring money into the city. Uh, another example could also be with Texas Stadium, Arlington Stadium being erected where it was. Um, this could also be an economic issue that may or may not be in line with planners in producing a just city where everyone benefits. Furthermore, Feinstein also goes on to agree with Jane Jacobs in her book entitled Death and Life of Great American Cities in which she argues that planners should not simply inquire what local residents think they need or want um, since there's various degrees and levels of residents that there could be too many conflicting um, desires in that planners need to focus on what works as a whole instead of just individual groups. Feinstein delves into the context of planning and explains that in the 1970s, neo-Marxists controlled structure planning through limited communication. People went along with the course of action contrary to their best interests because of the distorting effects of communication. Planners sought to move to a more open communication and speak the truths about outcomes. This created a hardship because if the powerful lost control, they might suppress truths or lie to the public to regain control. There was another problem. How to adequately represent the population. This ended up to be too hard because of a large diversity to re represent every group. There had to be almost 100% of the population in attendance in order to discuss options. This caused more problems due to disagreements. Another question arose. Who owns the city? In regards to who gets the benefits of what and who doesn't. In other words, who is the one that decides what to go forward with and what the outcomes are? Max Weber describes the ethic of absolute means as stressing tolerance in peaceful resolution of conflicts through negotiation. He also describes ethic of absolute end as a commitment to the overall goal regardless of public thought. Sometimes these are needed to make advances for the society as a whole. Examples of the German Social Security System and the British National Health Service have both resulted from autocratic or bureaucratic decision making. Some things like the development of affordable housing, placing of community-based facilities for disadvantaged people, and protection of the environment are as likely to derive from court decisions as well as from del deliberative democracy. Beauregard asserts that a re to realize a sustainable city that the city must be governed in a way that is attentive to the shared concerns of its people. In this formulation, governance is a means to an end rather than simply an end itself. Once a goal is desired, then it becomes necessary to theorize about this goal as well as about the strategy for reaching it. Scott Campbell's article that wrestles with the trade-offs between environment, growth, and social justice then seeks to outline solutions that encompass all three is an example of such theorizing. Feinstein goes on to end her article by describing the kinds of theories that is needed to change. There needs to be interaction between procedures and outcomes, not just divided interests without one paying attention to the other. Planners also need to look at past city developments and relationships with economies, environments, and they also need to focus on character in 
critique of the past, what worked, what didn't work. She also states that businesses are now the stimulation of action within the economy. Such as the case is Walmart having to plead their cases to come into cities to build their big box stores. Many cities are now standing up and saying that they do not want those big boxes in their within their city limits due to past instances of Walmart abandoning them and leaving them empty. Um, there also needs to be a marriage of mechanics and concern with outcomes and causes of outcomes. Another example of this would be the building at ground zero of you know the post world trade center um, the outcome of course is a new monument but planners also look to the cause of why they're there in incorporating the past um, wreckage debris artifacts from the world trade center and incorporating that into the outcome which would be the monument I now end the presentation with a quote from Susan Feinstein. She says, Planning theory ought to describe a goal along with the means of attaining it and the context which it rests. In other words, instead of just having a goal and only looking at the end result, we need to look at why and how we get to that result. Thank you for your time.